Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. The purpose of this podcast is to talk about successful financial advisors and what it takes to be successful. Not not just about how they're successful today, but the challenges they experience and have to overcome behind the scenes to reach where they are today. Because one of my favorite analogies of success is that it's like an iceberg. There's an exterior portion of success that we can all see, but most of what's really there, like an iceberg, is submerged between the surface. The sacrifices, the failures, along with the patient persistence and dedication and hard work that it really takes. And so in this context, I was thrilled to have as our first podcast guest, Rick Kaler. Rick is what virtually anyone would call a very successful financial advisory firm. He's based in Rapid City, South Dakota. His firm advised on more than $200 million of assets for 100 clients, generates about $1.2 million of revenue with seven employees, and Rick takes home upwards of $300,000 per year in total income from his practice. But it hasn't always been this way. During the podcast, Rick shares some of the challenges he's gone through as a financial advisor and business owner, including a lot of other businesses that he started from commercial real estate to hardwood floors and more, from which he's actually faced a whopping six near bankruptcies. And even just within his advisory practice alone, a couple of years ago, he went through a period of losing five out of six employees in a 60-day span. And so even though he's had an incredibly successful practice, he's gone through a lot of speed bumps along the way and and actually even shares on the podcast that he's still worried that 2016 may be his slowest growth year ever and is wondering whether now is even the time to sell. So I think you'll find this to be a fascinating discussion of the challenging reality that is being an entrepreneur and a financial advisor business owner and, and how even great success can come with a lot of speed bumps along the way, in, including what to me is one of the most ironic challenges, that the never satisfied with the status quo attitude that creates a lot of very successful businesses also makes it very difficult for that financial advisor business owner to ever be satisfied with the success that comes with it. If you want to check out more information on some of the resources we talk about on this podcast, be certain as well to go to www.kitsis.com slash one. That's www.kitsis.com forward slash and the number one for episode one to see our show notes with links to all the resources and other details that we talk about on the podcast. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this first episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Rick Kaler. Welcome, Rick Kaler, to the first Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you, Michael. It's an honor, and I appreciate uh, being here with you. So I, I'm excited to have you on the podcast, and just to to talk about the path that you've gone through as a financial advisor. So for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with Rick, uh, Rick's been in practice for me around Rick 33 years as a financial advisor. Yeah, that's somewhere in that realm. It kind of depends when you want to start counting it. I think I was doing financial planning like uh, medicine was practiced back in George Washington's days right. in 1979. So somewhere okay. between 33 and 37 years. Seven years. So you've been doing this a long time, uh, gone through a lot of the ups and downs that comes with being a financial advisor and a, and a business owner, and, and where I think we're going to talk about that a lot today, because you have some some interesting stories to share that I, that I think that I hope will resonate with other advisors out there, that we all go through these, these kinds of ups and downs, which is the reality of building a career and building a business. But I, I want to start, can you paint a little bit of a picture for us of what your business looks like today? So... Uh, what do you do? Who do you serve? What does your staffing look like? Where are you? Just help to paint us a little bit of a picture of Kaler Financial Group. Sure. We have uh, around 200 million AUM. Um, I think our gross this year will be around 1.2. We have uh, around 100 clients. So basically our clientele is considered high net worth. 
even today we have an uh, interviewee, and so we've, we're between seven and eight employees or staffing. And let me pause there really fast. What do they what do they do for you? Like if I drew sort of a mini org chart, like where do you, where is your role in, in the business and what do these people do uh, around you and supporting you? Yeah, we have officially two CFPs, which includes myself and okay. uh, uh, my director of financial planning, Sarah. Uh, we have one very close to being CFP who's um, probably got a month left left on his experience. Awesome. So we've got, uh, let's say, three CFPs and maybe two in training or three in training. We're, we're, we're playing a lot with our model. And recruiting here to Rapid City is very difficult. So we pretty much have to grow our planners. So for those of us who are not as geographically oriented how would i describe where rapid city is well i like to say it's um 2000 miles e or west of new york 1500 miles east of san francisco about 1200 miles north of dallas and directly south of north dakota but uh, rapid city That's, is probably is if you know very where, in the middle <laughs> very we're in the 400 middle. miles north of denver okay and uh, so okay, we're about and, and as far from an ocean as you can be in the United States. And and how how big is Rapid City as a like as a population as a city? The uh, metro area is one hundred and sixteen thousand. Okay. And fifty percent of our clients though live outside of the state of South Dakota. Okay, which is something we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, soon. And it, like, is there a big is there a bigger city nearby? Denver's it, 400 miles away. 400 miles away. So I'm, I like, I'm putting that in my East Coast context. Like, I live in D.C. I can drive to Manhattan in half that distance and cross like five states along the way. So yeah, well, you can drive all day here and just about not get out of the state. Okay. So, <laughs> and I and I think that's a good, that's a good context for. You know, some of the dynamics I know you've you've gone through and we're gonna talk about in the business of you know, the challenges of just growing and developing staff in, in general, but especially when you don't have a lot of local hiring options, you're not in a big massive major metropolitan area. It's I'm I'm going to guess even a little bit hard to convince people to move to Rapid City if they don't happen to already be from the Dakotas. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I hate to admit that because Rapid City is such a, a phenomenal place to live. And I can go, we can spend the whole podcast, of course, uh, talking about the benefits of South Dakota and Rapid City. Nevertheless, the uh, projection is where Fargo or uh, Sioux Falls and, you know, the snow falls here and it's up to our nose and I have a good friend in Boston and he said, you know, I've already shoveled twice this year. And I'm like, well, I haven't. Um, <laughs> but it is very difficult. I, I learned this when I was uh, a business broker. I never advertised a business in Minneapolis or Denver because the sale had to that. There's two sales with Rapid City. And the first one is living in Rapid City. And the second one is whatever you're selling. So it, it is very difficult to sell Rapid City. Um, and when I do a circular, I have as much on the city as I do on the, the position. But I have learned that geography trumps opportunity. My uh, headhunter says, you know, if you didn't live in Rapid City, I'd have a line out your door of people wanting to work for you. But when I, I say Rick Kaler, oh, yeah, that'd be great. In Rapid City, up uh, next. Interesting. That's, that's an interesting challenge that geography trumps opportunity at least in the in the hiring context as you said and we'll we'll talk about more perhaps not not so much in terms of attracting retaining clients since a lot of your since you haven't actually constrained your advisory business to to local clients but let let's finish painting the picture of the practice a little bit more just to get this understanding so 200 million of AUM about 100 clients so we can all sort of do the math the averages about two million dollars a client. So you, you've got a you've evolved up to a pretty high net worth kind of clientele. Seven or eight employees, including some CFPs and soon to be CFPs. So do you have a like? Is most of your team financial planners that are supporting clients? Do you have a lot of ops and investment staff as well? What does that look like? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a little heavier on the ops side, uh, definitely on the ops and support side than I am the professionals. I am still in almost every meeting here. Okay. Uh, which is really inefficient, uh, which <laughs> I think speaks to the fact I, I was, as I was preparing for this podcast and I'm listing all of my failures, I'm like, good God, how have I had any success whatsoever? And I got thinking, you know, what, it, what Michael might ask me what the success has been attributed to. And um, I had to think pretty hard on that. And I think a lot of it is the, the E-Mint principle is I was a technician. I, I was very much a technician and still to some degree am. And I think like a lot from my era of kind of being amongst the founders of, of the financial planning, the generation that founded financial planning, um, I've had to grow up. Uh, you know, and learn a little bit how to manage. And I think being an entrepreneur is in my blood. Uh, so for me, I think it's really the management uh, piece that's been the most challenging. But definitely, I'm still a technician and, and too much of a technician. I actually love that analogy. For those who aren't familiar, e- E-Myth by Michael Gerber, which is a fantastic book. I, I really highly recommend, actually, especially for financial advisors who enjoy doing financial planning and are thinking about becoming a financial planning business owner. And and the the analogy that Emith tells is, you know, we have this oppression about how entrepreneurs form and and I believe the analogy they use is is, is someone who makes pies. So like I think her name was Sally. So Sally makes pies. She's wonderful at making pies. She makes fantastically delicious pies. All of her friends say, you're so great at making pies, you should make a pie shop. And so Sally goes out and makes a pie shop and then discovers that once you make a pie shop, you are not actually pie making anymore. You are managing customers and equipment and ovens and office leases and hiring and managing staff. And all of a sudden, you're doing a whole bunch of things that actually have nothing to do with the thing you were originally good at, which is which is just making pies and enjoying making pies. And that for many people, that actually becomes a real wall or a real challenge for them where they, they start out doing a thing they love and once it turns into a business and they get further and further from the thing they originally loved doing because they've got to do all this other stuff of making the business a business that it, it actually becomes much less enjoyable for them because they get they they get forced so far from what they were doing originally and, and to me that's why we still have so many advisory firms that are led by a solo advisor and either no staff or a relatively modest number of staff because I, I think for some of us, we we kind of reach those limits or like, if I grow any bigger, I'm not going to get to do the things that I like doing that I originally started my business to do. And sometimes we put the, the brakes on it because of that dynamic. So is, is that actually a an issue for you, Rick? Like, do you want to grow to the point where you hire up more planners or develop the ones you've got to a more senior level and they start handling all the clients and you're in the business of managing financial planners in a financial planning firm as opposed to being the lead planner with your clients? Yeah, that that's the, the trajectory that I am certainly on. And I think you summed it up uh, really well about being very intentional in our growth. I've had uh, one of my earliest uh, planners became a CFP, left me, and she maintained as a solo. And part of why she left was she did not want to manage people. And uh, she's been a solo for 25 years since she left. I made the decision to grow. Part of that, I think, was um, just uh, being a compulsive entrepreneur, that growth was just um, inherently the way to go. So I, I, th- I don't think I grew as, in, as intentionally, perhaps, as um, uh, maybe I could have. It was more on autopilot that, of course, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to grow? And it's a great question for anybody to ask themselves. Who doesn't want more revenue coming in, right? And at least hopefully, and, and hopefully more profits coming to the bottom well, line. And that's the illusion that there'll be more revenue. Um, <laughs> It, it, there, there won't necessarily be. And, and for example, I travel a lot. And part of, I, I don't believe that my gross really supports seven or eight uh, people here. I know uh, planning companies that do it with less than that. 
And if we were just investment oriented, we do it with much less than that. Right. Um, but part of that is also my a lifestyle choice on my part. And I know other planners that are the same where you look at their bottom line profit and you're like, oh, why are you doing this? And then they're only working, you know, in the office maybe six months out of the year. So, right. so that's another thing to look at because you don't have that as a solo planner. You don't have that uh, opportunity to take off as much, but with te technology today, of course, it makes it uh, a lot easier to run a planning practice. So can I ask how much does your practice make? I mean, I'm assuming as most advisory firms, there's kind of, there's maybe some slice you pay yourself as an owner, as a, an advisor in the firm, there's some that is simply pass through profit. So, I mean, if we merge those together, like, how much is this business making for you to support this lifestyle? Of yeah, course? we try to set my salary. I think my salary is set at about a hundred and eighty or ninety. Uh, we try to set all of our salaries based on the d the data, and uh, okay. we shoot for median um, and tweak it to, for example, in Rapid City, Michael, you can make fifty thousand, and in DC you are going to need to make 90000 to have right. the same lifestyle. Right. Uh, so I think with bonuses and everything, we figure my compensation is about 250 The profitability is probably only 15%, so maybe another 150 So my total is probably 350 ish in that range. So, I, mean, that's a, I mean, that's a big number, right? The Median household income across the U.S. I think is something like fifty-two thousand dollars, and frankly, as you just noted, fifty-two thousand, never mind three hundred fifty-two thousand dollars, goes up a heck of a lot further in in Rapid City than it does, uh, you know, where I am on the East Coast in the Washington D.C. area. So, by any sort of natural measure, this is a pretty darn profitable practice that you built for yourself, and quite a great income. So, I'm curious then. As it grew and it went forward, I mean, we were just talking about this e-myth dynamic of, you know, at some point, maybe you, you start getting to this level where it's kind of neat that the revenue is going up or maybe it's not, but like you're working a lot harder and it's not getting any easier or better. You're just getting further away from the stuff that you enjoyed doing. Have, have you hit that wall before? I mean, when you look back over since 1983, has it just kind of been this more or less straight line of slowly and steadily accumulating clients until you got to the great number and an employee count that you have today? Or have you hit points where you had to pause and say, maybe I actually don't want to just continue on this trajectory because I'm getting too far from actually just seeing clients and doing the financial planning I like doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. For me, the growth has really been very slow and steady. I just got back from the Galapagos where you have turtles crossing the road and you got to stop <laughs> and wait for them. And I think that's a very much uh, the growth of my practice. Probably a lot of people don't know, even though I've been in this profession for, let, let's just call, call it 35 years to be somewhat even. It took me 22 years before this was my only business focus, almost my only business focus. Uh, it took me 20, 22 years to get the income up to one third of what I was making uh, in the uh, commercial real estate appraisal mortgage property casualty business. I had five businesses at, at one time. So part of my story is um, I, I have a men's group that listen to me complain every week that what I loved was the financial planning. What I hated was everything else I was doing and what I was making me the money that was sustaining my lifestyle was everything else I was doing. Interesting. So, so ironically, actually, for you, the evolution towards financial planning was actually like a an emith phenomenon of getting away from the other businesses that you were that you were doing that you didn't actually enjoy doing those businesses because you wanted to be the financial planning technician. Exactly, uh, I did career counseling uh, probably in my thirties or forties, and uh, she looked at that and said, "Well, uh, first of all, why do you live in Rapid City, South Dakota? According to this, you ought to live in Manhattan or or Central London." <laughs> and I said, "Well, that's where I vacation." And then she said, well, let's see, number two on your list is um, a uh, financial advisor. And number one is a marketing executive. And I said, what's a marketing executive do? 
she said, collect data and write reports. I said, oh, that's like appraising, which I also did at the same at that time too. But real estate was way down, didn't way down on the list. Because what what were you doing in real estate? I mean, it, it was appraising and and that kind of work, or or mortgages, or like actual just sales. I I did sales. I did commercial. Uh, I did residential for a little while, but I m- migrated to the sales. I was a CCIM, which is kind of the CFP of commercial realtors. Like I was the second one in the state, I think. So I was really competent. Um, my success in real estate had nothing to do with my ability to build rapport with people and glad hand and um, be uh, emotionally intelligent. I just was really, really competent and I knew my numbers. So that was, that was my real estate career. I also started a discount mortgage company and uh, we did phenomenally well buying and selling uh, sell, seller carryback mortgages. I started a PC company and then uh, we had a property management company and an appraisal company. I'm also a general certified appraisal appraiser and hold that license. And so you were doing these in the 80s, 90s, 70s, while also 80s, all the way back to the 70s. <laughs> all the way back, Michael. While also having an advisory firm. Like when did the financial advisory firm part yeah, start? Yeah, that started really around 79 when I'm working as a commercial broker with people. And I'm saying, boy, there's nobody advocating for people. They got all this gold they want to sell them and real estate they want to sell them and cash value, life insurance. And there's nobody standing alongside of the client, which today I recognize as fiduciary, and uh, helping them. In fact, my brother and I were uh, led the uh, movement in South Dakota for realtors to become fiduciaries. And we actually got kicked, or we didn't quite get kicked out. They were wanting to kick us out of our MLS because we had this wild idea of actually being a fiduciary to a buyer. Uh, so the idea of fiduciary but was in my the deal, Eric. You well, can't yeah. do that, Rick. <laughs> no, this is not how we operate here. And so we were on the cutting edge of being fiduciary. So fiduciary was always in my blood. So when I looked at, well, somebody needs to 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 maybe charge a fee to folks and and just help them make financial decisions. And I kind of started that in '79, and didn't know what to call this profession that I. Th- kind of thought maybe I was inventing and I found out in probably 80 81 that oh there's actually a college called the College of Financial Planning oh that's what this is and so I found out I didn't invent financial planning or the internet I enrolled and became the first CFP graduate or first CFP in South Dakota in 1983 and so what were you because you already were doing commercial real estate and residential real estate and mortgage and the other things like what did your planning firm do back then and how were what were you getting paid for as a financial advisor back then like was it still tied to implementing real estate and helping clients invest in real estate or were you doing other products or were you just like hey i'll do a financial plan for you and you can pay me a thousand dollars or whatever the going number was and you just did that on the side while you were still doing commercial real estate? Right. Um, early, early on, my good friend and mentor was uh, George Chell, uh, was 100% sales. And so I did get all the licenses in the Series 7 and the Series 24. And he was a big uh, buy term and invest the rest guy. The cash value people in Rapid City tried to run us both out of town, too, back in the day. But I very quickly decided, you know, the selling the products is not the way to go. And so I inherently really started fee only before NAPFA was even found, actually. And so I was in a partnership with George, who was 100% commission, and I was 100% fee. And he'd always say, Rick, you know, you could be earning four times as much if you were selling stuff. And I said, yeah, and it's not my day job. You know, I don't have to. I can, I can afford to be ideological uh, with this. So, um, You were an early fee-only planner because you could afford to not make any I money. I was fee-only when fee-only wasn't cool. 
back in the day of Peter West Weston and uh, Bob Underwood and and um, I, and I grew up in the FPA, ironically. Which back then was the the predecessor. So there were two predecessors, right? We have the IAFP and the ICFP. ICFP so the right. IAFP was kind of known as a little bit more of the product centric side. The ICFP was more of the pure financial planning side that grew up out of the CFPs directly. So you were on the ICFP, ICFP side. side. Yeah, I started, I went to the third retreat ever, I think was in Logan, Utah. And that's where I grew up listening to Eileen Sharkey, who was Fiona at the time, and, and Dick Wagner and uh, uh, Kemp Fain and, you know, Bill Carter and, and some of those early folks. And so as you're doing this business, so you're primarily a commercial real estate broker, appraiser, doing mortgages as well, and financial planning is just kind of this itch on the side you scratch and occasionally get paid something yeah I, I just started doing plans you know and i've had every way of charging probably that there is except maybe on income and uh, you hit a really important thing i wanted to cover is i was really clear early on that this could not be a smoke and mirrors to sell real estate even though you really were in the heavily in the business of selling real estate right. which was quite financially rewarding right and i i was okay. very clear i didn't want it out in our community community that well rick kaler's just doing financial plans and what what happens is you end up owning all this real estate so i wouldn't let my clients buy my financial planning clients buy real estate from me you actually wouldn't let you wouldn't let them no. so like if they they followed through you couldn't do it you had to go to i guess someone else right in town right and so i them sent them place. to um to my good friend who sold them uh, uh, real estate limited partnerships. And in the end of the day, oh. I would have been, they, my poor clients would have been way ahead had I taken the conflict of interest and sold them real estate in Rapsi because it's done real good. And of course, everybody lost all their money in the limited partnerships. Right. I was say like that, that, that did not turn out well for people in real estate <laughs> limited partnerships in the 1980s. So for those who aren't familiar for some of the, the history of it, so the real estate, I don't even know how to compare it. I mean, I guess re real estate limited partnerships in the early to mid 80s were as hot as ETFs are today, but massively commission laden, driven primarily for tax incentives that existed at the time to the point where people didn't even actually buy economically sound investments. The math only or barely made sense because of the uh, the tax benefits that were associated with it. And then in 1986, President Reagan did the Tax Reform Act of 86 and drastically simplified and in the process kind of crushed a lot of real estate tax preferences. And when the tax preferences went away and you were just left with the underlying economic value of the real estate limited partnership and there wasn't much value, people had massive swaths of catastrophic losses. Like, is that a fair, fair like brief summary of kind of how that played out right the cl closest thing we have today would be the private REITs and there you can actually get your money out of a private REIT so they're far better whereas for some of the real estate limited partnerships the, there just wasn't even any any money to to get out so so ironically in the day you tried to manage your conflicts of interest by sending it out the door and then it actually went to someone that sold products that turned out to be worse so so did that change anything for how you I guess either did your business or or looked at a, like a due diligence process about how you refer out to other professionals. It definitely opened my eyes to sometimes we can get uh, pretty uh, holier than thou on the fee only side and not necessarily be serving the client and 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 a side would be for example somebody who's a fee offset. You know, I think there's a huge case that could be made that that may be more fiduciary uh, oriented than being uh, fee only. But that's not the point of what we're talking about today. But it, I did hold very, very hard to not selling uh, financial planning clients real estate. And it, it worked out. Plus, you know, so few people really ought to be owning real estate directly. Very few people. Because you need to be of a... A certain financial size or net worth just to be able to own it and diversify reasonably and deal with all the 
property management crap that comes with it, well, basically. Yeah, I would tell people who wanted to even buy houses for investment, why don't you go get uh, four or six weeks worth of education and find out what this business is about because uh, real estate is a business. And, and ironically, as I was reflecting on what we're talking about today, 85% of my net worth has nothing to do with the value that I've built in my financial planning company. In fact, if I had never gone into financial planning, uh, I suspect my net worth would be the same as it is today. Most of my uh, success uh, as far as net worth has come from what I learned in uh, real estate and just investing, but it has nothing to do with the income or what I have built in my practice. Interesting. So you said about 12 years ago, a transition started to come where you were doing the real estate business and the financial planning on the side, but it was still not getting up to much dollars relative to the real estate business. So what, what, like, when did that transition come and what what drove it yeah that was back uh, around 2000 was kind of this turning point for me that's when i met uh, george kinder i was in the second group that he trained to do his two-day seminar and it's at that that i met elizabeth jeton and gail coleman and ed jacobson and um marcy yeager and and so for those who aren't familiar george kinder often recognizes being as either the founder or one of the founders of the life planning movement and and efforts to tie financial planning and financial goals much more directly to what people really find sort of truly fulfilling in life. So did, did you go to that, Rick, to because you were interested in doing that for your clients and just wanted to go a new direction in the in the advisory business what what took you yeah I, I i i guess one of the things i've been is typically somewhat visionary i'm not real sure how that all has happened but i i felt that what we were doing in the investment side was going to become a commodity and this was even before daniel kahneman's research that said 90 uh, percent of all financial decisions are made emotionally and i just assumed i had better find out a little bit about um adding value, increasing the value proposition. Because like a lot of planners uh, in the 80s and 90s, I had really drifted toward being uh, investment focused with a little yellow pad financial planning. So it really was a more of a marketing and uh, how do I stay relevant issue. I had uh, also uh, had a divorce, uh, when was that? 1992, I think, 91, 92. And I had done a lot of uh, group therapy. And so when I saw what George was doing and I applied that a little bit to, wow, you know, people do this therapy and never talk about money at all. It kind of started hitting me how uh, those two worlds came together. And it was that time that I thought, you know, I'm telling people, people, uh, my clients, you need to do what you love, which was a huge theme of us back in 2000, 2001, 2002. And here I was uh, earning most of my uh, standard of living doing what I really didn't love. So it caused a lot of angst within me. And finally, I, I took the plunge to say, I'm going to get out, I'm going to stop doing the commercial real estate and uh, scale back on the appraisals and jump into financial planning. And I, I took about a two-third pay cut when I did that for a couple of years. So there are a lot of interesting these things there I want to ask you about more. But first, just, just in terms of this, the, the transition itself. So you decided you want to do this shift and then you sought out Kinder Institute to execute it or did going through George's program actually drive some of this change? So I certainly I know a number of advisors that have gone through uh, the evoke training process that that George teaches and like it, it's it's transformed them as much as it's been a about transforming their clients that came later but it started just it it hit them personally and led them to changing and reforming their business so yeah. is it 
was it that kind of dynamic for you? You keep you keep going back and reminding people who these people were and how it was way back then. You know, I'm I've got a mirror over here and I'm looking at the gray, reminding myself. And back in that day, Michael, there was no Evoke. George wasn't there. Was okay. There, there, George wasn't training Evoke. He was training people to train uh, his two-day seminar, and so it was a train the trainer uh, experience. Okay. So, no, I didn't go to him for any help or, or I was already clear that I wanted to do financial planning. And I had been clear okay. for 20 years I really wanted to do financial planning. <laughs> you just you just only did it kind of on the side while real estate paid the paid It the bills. was the money. It's like, um, you know, maybe I remember... I, I can't tell you what year this is. My gross from financial planning was 40, you know, and my gross from everything else I was doing was 150 or 200. And uh, I just couldn't quite make the numbers work. So, sounds like a great time to drop the 150 and go for the 40. So I think finally when I got it up to around 80 or so, or I forget what my gross was. I, I know I uh, did a lot of coaching with uh, Tracy Beckus for about eight years. And I think when I started with her, our gross was 110. And I'm guessing that was 12 or 13 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, wow. But I did make the jump and moved out and got my own office because I was doing all my financial planning out of my real estate office <laughs> and uh, finally got the courage to take the financial hit to just go 100% financial planning. How much money were you getting out of the financial planning business when you decided to actually make this transition? Like how much of a hit was it? What sticks in my mind is about two thirds. And uh, probably if I was making 150000 a year back then, which would probably be close to 250 or 300 a day. I think right. I stepped down to about 50 or 60,000. What drives that kind of change to walk away from that much money, right? I mean, if we'll put it in today's, maybe try to inflation just to today's dollars. So you're, you're making 250 to 300 grand and you decide, hey, I got a great idea. I'm just going to go do planning and make about 80, which grand isn't like a bad number in the grand scheme of things. But if you're used to 250 and a certain lifestyle that goes with it, that's pretty traumatic for virtually any human being, I think. Yeah. So so what what drives it? Like, was it that you were just so unhappy in the real estate business that you needed to change? Was it that you were just so excited to do financial planning or like income be damned? I think this, this thing's going to be bigger in 10 years anyway, so let's just go. What gets you to the moment of actually taking that kind of look. <laughs> 20 years of angst. You know, <laughs> I tell my my uh, friends, you guys are got to be tired of hearing me over and over say the same thing. And finally, there was just, uh, uh, it was kind of like taking the dive off the diving board. And I had uh, enough saved back. And I, I fortunately never lived on everything I made. So... What I think what it meant was I didn't I didn't save anything for a number of years and I wasn't okay. funding a 401ks and IRAs or whatever I had going back then. And um, uh, because I had a, a money script that if you earn less in any one year, you were failing or a failure. And that really kept me hooked into I can't uh, just take the dive and go into financial planning because... I can't earn less in any one year. So it probably took me 20 years of therapy just to be able to get through that script. I know you have a lot of background for this, but I'm, I'm not sure all of our listeners do. So what's a, what's a money script? You just use that label. Yeah, money script is a, a, a thought or a belief that we have about money that is uh, circumstantially true in some cases and uh, false in others. It's a partial truth. So those classic, like, I'm not, my business isn't successful unless it grows every year, or I'm, I'm not financially successful unless my income grows every year. That would, that's, yeah. that's an example. It, it, right. And then they can, our money scripts can serve us well, but when the circumstances change, uh, they're not always true. I mean, does it mean that you're a failure because you have less income 
uh, in any one year. I think most rational people would say no. I personally plan for uh, construction, people in construction, for celebrities, and their income is all over the place. You know, it's right. way high one year and low the next. But for me, nope. If I make less, I'm doing something wrong. So it took a while to get through that script and give myself permission. Yeah, I'm going to make less. And I think within two or three years, my income was, was back up to where it, it was. Uh, and I didn't start. I stopped the real estate. I still had a few other businesses giving me some residual. And I, it took me two or three years to stop the appraisals. So, so there was a little easing into it. But basically, I, I think the biggest thing, Michael, is I, I practiced what I preached. I, I, I uh, saved a lot. And I maybe lived on 50% of my income. So that helped me out a lot. It was more giving up my savings and scaling back, maybe not so many trips and things like that. But it wasn't like I was, uh, I went from eating uh, meat to all uh, beans and rice. Right. That to me is actually one of those pieces that, that often doesn't get told about you know, the, the transitions that people make when they, when they do these sorts of switches and what goes on behind the scenes. You know, I went through a similar one when I was kind of internal to advisory firms for nearly the first 10 years of my career. And then at one point decided to take the proverbial leap and say, no, no, no I'm going to materially dial back my time in the advisory firm. And I'm going to really focus on this uh, world of, of speaking and educating advisors and writing a newsletter and, and a lot of services that I uh, transitioned to and many of which I still do today. And, you know, when I made that transition, it was a similar kind of phenomenon. I was probably stepping away from about two thirds of my income is actually a pretty good estimate of, of what that financial switch was like for me as well. But the distinction was I lived really frugally. I had not actually lifted my lifestyle much from what I was making seven or eight years prior after just a couple of years into my into my career so by the time i was making that transition i mean for me i i was still renting and not owning i was renting an apartment i was splitting with some buddies so i mean i i think i i think my rent was less than five thousand dollars a year was my share i had a uh old junker of a car that was full paid up so i had no car payments so like my my over my fixed overhead was so low that it was mentally traumatic to walk away from that much income and to take a plunge into a, a two thirds hole. But you know the the personal financial planning, keeping my household expenses in order and not getting stuck into some lifestyle creep phenomenon, meant I had the clearance to do that and not put myself into financial dire straits or have to you know, launch my business on credit cards from scratch because there was no no personal spending buffer from covering my expenses if I didn't have 100% of my old income. Absolutely. Uh, I, th I think that's really well said. I remember when we went into the mortgage business, I went into business uh, in a partnership with an Irish carrot farmer who moved from Ireland. Uh, to do this with me and I said okay we got to get a receptionist and we got to get a office and he just looked at me and he says see that file cabinet over there yep see the bottom drawer yep that's our office <laughs> <laughs> so he taught me about oh. overhead and uh, yeah I, I've never borrowed I don't have any debt uh, on the business which helps a lot uh, with uh, making decisions and and relieves a lot of uh, pressure, so yeah. it's critical. So once you made the switch to the advisory firm, you said you it, you took about a two third step back in income, but you made most of that back in the first within two or three years out of the gate. So how how did it how did it rebound that quickly? Was it just one of those things like, hey, now that I finally got actually have full time to focus on the planning firm I can go out there and get clients and you just got clients fast enough to get back to your old number was yeah, it that simple I, I think that was part of it and that was back I remember for years we grew at 22 percent a year you know 25 20 to 25 percent every year and there were some uh, good years in uh, the markets you know uh, the markets may have, have been going up 10 percent a year which provided growth there various periods of time so I don't ever remember just getting a huge influx to where 
we were just had to double the, our size. But for most of my practice, in the last 10 or 15 years, we have not had to, to market. And I've had an office manager who didn't want to grow. And we just walk the, the uh, edge of, um, uh, of being completely overwhelmed and not being able to service our clients for many, many years. But it wasn't always that way. I remember going to the FPA retreat or the ICFP retreat at that time and hearing these guys talk about they don't market and there's, there's lines out their doors. And I'm like, how do you do that? Because <laughs> I'm out taking every breathing person that has any money at all to plan for. I'm like, I, you know, Tracy Beck. You can fuck a mirror, you're a prospect, right? Well, yeah, and, and here's your ideal client Tracy would talk about. And I'm like, Tracy, my ideal client is somebody that will write me a check. Um, <laughs> so I lived in that space for a long time. And only in the last few years have really started uh, honing down our ideal client. And yeah, there's been a lot of times I just wish the phone wouldn't ring because we just can't take another client. And this year, things are starting to turn around. We're kind of wishing that the phone would ring. I mean, we're, we're actually coming off uh, the worst year of growth in, our, in my entire 35 years in the business. It's funny. We just recently did an article on the on the blog as well. We'll we'll include it in the the podcast show notes on the site. That you know, when we actually look at it from that perspective, uh, the whole industry, the whole financial advisor world, seems to be witnessing a slowdown in uh, in referrals, like a pretty dramatic slowdown in referrals, and that across all. All firms, at least when you lump them all together, we we're actually seeing in the data now that the the firms that spend on outbound business development are actually getting more more business from doing external business development uh, than we're getting from all inbound referrals combined from both clients and centers of influence by by almost a two to one margin. So. Not all firms are doing those kinds of spends, but a small subset of firms are doing it and actually you know, collectively enjoying more than twice the growth of everybody else combined. And that the, it seems like there's this slowdown underway in, in growing from referrals alone. Yeah, it's got our attention. I just put two of our, um, our associates through sales training. Uh, they're coming in and telling me about with it or something. And uh, it's stuff I learned 40 years ago, feature, we called it FAB, feature, advantage, benefit. Um, and, and there's just a recoil in me um, because we are not salespeople. So, so, where do you, so where do you send financial planning team to sales training? Because it seems like there's kind of a lack of those programs. Fortunately, at their desk, uh, we found a trainer. I forget her name escapes me right now. Her first name's Nancy. They did it all virtually. She's just started doing this virtually. Uh, Nancy, Nancy Bleak, yes, perhaps, yes. Sales Pro Insider. So we'll we'll include a note to that in the in the show notes as well. I know a couple other advisors who've uh, who've gone through her sales training. I think they call it Sales Pro Insider. And for us, what we found out is really the inquiries haven't slowed down much, but our closing ratio. Yeah, it just went in the tank. So people are shopping you more against other advisors? Is that kind that, of the that's, that's our thinking. And also, um, you know, I am just a, a pathetic compared to uh, where I used to be in closing. I mean, in real estate, hey, if you don't close, you don't eat, right? So right. I knew how to close and the assumptive close. I was never what I considered high pressure. But here, I'm kind of like, well, here's what we do. Uh, you go away and think about it because I'm never going to call you ever again. And if you want to become a client, <laughs> You pick up the phone and give us a call. <laughs> and, and, and I'm having to rethink my ways. Working now. Yeah. <laughs> is that just a statement on how the industry has evolved? I mean, I, I mean, I'm envisioning you know, particularly 10 plus years ago. If you if you're going out telling life planning kinds of stories, and everybody else is you know was selling mutual funds back then, like. 
I would imagine just what you did was so apparently different to people out of the gate that the the folks who were interested in that really would just follow up with you with a phone call and say, hey, I talked to one or two others and I really like what you do. Let's go. And and now I don't know that life playing necessarily has that wide of an adoption, but but so many more firms are at least I'll call it reasonably holistic in what they do now, particularly if you're a client that's searching for it, that's just harder to stand out and differentiate and close the same number of people. You know, I I really have had so very few people come to me because we do life planning or because we do financial therapy. Most everybody that comes becomes a client does so uh, because, number one, uh, they're concerned about their investments, or number two, they're concerned about if the money's going to run out. And typically, once we brought them on, they would become amazed. I'm remembering one client said, I had no clue you did all of this. And pretty much our life planning financial therapy is uh, take what you want and leave the rest. And we tell people all the time, no is a complete sentence. So uh, yes, we've had some come on from that, but it's actually differentiates us more within the industry than it does within the retail clients. Interesting. So people have just kind of come to you steadily over time, 10 to 15 years of focusing on this got you from a handful of clients to 100 clients and $200 million of revenue. I mean, has it been a more or less steady growth path outside of, I guess, obviously 2008 would have been some hiccup in assets and and revenue tied to assets. But uh, has it just more or less been the more years you do it, the more clients you accumulate and the bigger the business gets? Yeah, it's been uh, very steady. And actually, 2008 was not our worst year. I think this year is going to end up being our worst year. I think this will be worse than 2008. No, and we adopted a retainer model uh, uh, some time ago and went away from the AUA uh, quarterly charges. So that really helped us in uh, 2008. So you, when you went through 2008, you were already on a structure where you were just charging retainer fees, not not AUM fees, right? So how do you how do you set that retainer? Fee? We, we like still do we it? still calculate it as a uh, percentage of net worth, um, and we charge on real estate. We, uh, I'm sorry, on assets, worth, on assets, assets. no, okay. on assets. Um, okay. Because on real estate, we're going to. If you got two million dollars worth of real estate, we're going to charge the same whether you got a two million dollar loan or it's free and clear. Because uh, arguably, there's going to be a lot more uh, work involved <laughs> if you got a two hundred million dollar loan on two. But you're charging based on not assets, as I think most advisors think of it, which is the assets in the investment account. You're speaking quite literally, like make the client's entire net worth balance sheet, take the assets column. <laughs> We bill on that. Yes, we bill on that. Have everything. We have an uh, illiquid rate and a liquid rate. And what are those rates? How do you? How the do you illiquid rate's twenty basis points. Okay. And that's where my real estate background and business appraisal background serves me well because I can get really close to what those those assets are worth. And we let the client set it by the most part, but I I'll know if the the client's blowing smoke. Right, if they're like, oh yeah, that that vacant land lot I've got out there, that's only worth like fifty thousand dollars, and you say, no, I know they built three shopping centers right next to it. That's probably yeah, five hundred thousand dollars. Let's, let's call the county and see what the county says it's worth. Yeah. So <laughs> that's pretty easy. So we charge twenty basis points on that. It would include fixed uh, annuities that we would lump in that category. Maybe some closely held uh, stock, even of a publicly traded company, if they work for it. Whatever we consider illiquid is 20 basis points, okay. and that's the, the planning fee. And then the rest were very, very standard, 1% of the first million, 0.75% of the next, okay. uh, et cetera. So do you build that AUM portion out of an AUM portfolio, or do the clients just get a, a like a, a, an annual retainer fee that you calculated based on the assets or quarterly? How do you... How do you structure and then how do you actually build? We've chosen Halloween to be the date that we value all of our assets. <laughs> is, is that like a – is that meant to be a joke about Halloween? No, is no. Like it it, it just kind of no. happened that way. It was uh, – we had to have enough time for us to, to year-end calculations so we can tell them what their fee is going to be the next year. So we chose 1031. 
So on 1031, we value everything and set the retainer for the next year. And I know some of my peers will s set that retainer for two years, even three years. Uh, we still do it annually. Uh, and then we just divide by four and either send them a bill, an invoice quarterly, or uh, deduct it from their account, whichever works best for them. But if they're deducting from their account, I mean, they're deducting the whole fee from the investment account that you happen to manage. Correct. And from your end, I mean, they, whether they give it to you to manage or they leave it at their old advisor or they dump it all at Vanguard and just buy some ETFs directly. I mean, your fee is exactly, effectively exactly the same, whether you're literally managing it or just advising on it wherever it happens to be Correct. Held. We will take accounts of five million or more from just an investment only standpoint. But other okay. than that, we don't want, here's an account, will you manage it? Uh, we see ourselves as financial planners. And I tell people managing your assets is one, your liquid assets is one seventh of what we do. And quite frankly, it's the easiest thing that we do. Does it take having the kind of real estate background you've got to be able to have a fee structure like that that assesses fees on illiquid real estate assets? Or do you think that's something that any advisor can I do? I think any advisor can do it. I mean, yes, I have an expertise in it. We've had talk around here about how do we replace that. And you use those assets, you put them in your Money Guide Pro or whatever your financial planning software is. You're making decisions on it. You're making decisions about maybe when to sell. That's all part of the planning process, and we feel it needs to be captured in that, uh, along with closely held business value. So I think any planner can be doing that. I don't think you need to have an expertise in it because we're not managing that real estate. We're not managing that business. We're planning for it. Do you get clients that push back on that, that say, like, look, I, you know, my house is my house. I've owned it for 27 years. I'm going to die in it. I don't need to pay you 20 basis points for advice on a house that I'm not looking to do anything with. Like, do you get that kind of pushback? Good point. Uh, we don't charge on personal assets. Including personal, including personal Right, personal resident we won't charge on or a vacation home we won't charge on. Or personal property or cars or things like that we don't charge on. But we will charge okay, on the rental real estate. And we will charge on the businesses. Sure. And yes, we get pushback. I got one of our largest clients coming in next month and he informed our planner that he thinks he'd like to go investment only because uh, we pretty much have the planning done. The, the funny thing about this, I think his fee's around 35000 I think 6000 of that fee is on his illiquid assets. So if we do the investments, we're going to be charging him around 29000 In a heartbeat, I'll do that. Are you kidding me? He's got 23 different entities. He's one of the most complex clients we've got. Obviously, we haven't done a very good job of selling what's going on behind the scenes for him. Because for him to give up $6,000, to give up the planning, he is crazy. <laughs> so is that the distinction you make that, look, if you want to be investment only, we'll manage the assets, we'll manage just the assets you give us, you've got that investment AUM fee schedule. Or if you want the holistic experience, then we bill on all your assets, we've got the liquid rate and the illiquid rate, and you get comprehensive financial plan that goes with it. Like, is, is that the distinction? That's the distinction for over $5 million. That's right. Okay. At over And under, you just don't even let them do that that separation Correct. or it looks different? Yeah, we don't let them do that because it, it, then it's just, you know, I've managed assets before. It's what have you done for me uh, lately. Quite frankly, we're uh, a combination of passive-active uh, with the active being mostly alternative. I think you came up with the term once of what I did. I used to think I was buy and hold and I'm not because we rebalance. So, but, but it's not rocket scientists here. You know, we, do, we don't have a, uh, a real sexy um, investment story to sell where we're in and out and trading and doing all that crazy stuff. So you, you, you don't want investment only clients. They're just eventually going to say you haven't done anything exciting lately to which you say, well, we don't, we don't, we're not trying to do anything <laughs> yeah, exciting. Exactly. Either. And I don't want to compete with Betterment or Vanguard. So talk to me from the staffing side. So when you made the switch 15 years ago or so to focus on the planning firm, did you have staff support? Was it just, was it just you? And then as you 
grew clients and revenue you started hiring? What did that look like? When we moved into this building, I think there were three of us, three of us, or okay. maybe four of us. And what were they doing? Um, I had kind of my main paraplanner, office manager, and then she had a couple of assistants. And she was with me for about eight years. I, I've been fairly successful hiring folks that would actually manage the employees. Uh, early on, I felt that I was not much of a manager. And both my brother and I would hire a sales manager for our real estate company back in that day, recognizing that we're technicians. So that worked pretty successful. I have, I've had two people be with me eight years, so that's about 16 years of um, wow. them managing the office. So we, we eventually grew, and we grew to a point. I, I, I would go to my study groups, and they would look at my labor costs, and they would just say, you are way too high something is wrong and I just I didn't know what was wrong enough to know what was wrong so I uh, you know I was just barely eking out a salary and I certainly didn't have the profitability I probably wasn't even profitable by uh, what we define as profit today once we take my salary out and I lost I went through a period of time where I had six people working for me and I lost five out of six in 60 days you lost five out of six employees in 60 days. Like, was this like literally an organized protest? Like they all got together and said, Rick, we can't stand you and we're all quitting together. Like, how does, yeah, how does, that, how does happen? that happen? Yeah. Uh, the first one hurt herself. No, the first one was moving out of town to Phoenix. Then uh, the second one was my, just got her CFP and came in and quit the day I was going to give her a raise. And the third one uh, hurt herself and couldn't come back to work. The fourth one then hurt herself a few weeks later and couldn't come back to work. Felt like fell over six foot concrete wall type of a thing. Ooh. And Ooh. then the last one, I remember I, that was when I was doing the work uh, with Onsite and Ted Klontz in the early days of developing financial therapy. And I was at the Nashville airport. I could take you. It was at gate four. I could take you to the seat I was standing at. I got a call from Darla who says, well, you'll, you'll never guess this. I said, Leisha quit. She says, right. So that was number five. And she went to take like double the salary at a bank. I mean, God, what happens to your business when five out of six quit? I mean, yeah, well, I, I don't even know where to start. What, what do you what do you do yeah, when you hit well, that? You start... What do you do? What did you do when you hit that? Mo like, do you start scrambling? Do you crawl into a fetal position and just rock yourself to sleep? Well, like, what? all of the above. You know, I'm kind of come up with contingency plans of trying to retain the best, the biggest clients. And Darla literally worked weekends for 18 months. So I wouldn't even have this practice without her commitment. And uh, so we worked our butts off. We hired a consultant that came in and said, well, no wonder you guys had all these um, inefficiencies. Look how you're using Juncture. You guys are using about 2% of it. And I remember writing her that check. It was a $2,500 consulting check. And she's on the phone. I said, by the way, I am signing your check right now. And I want you to know I am smiling ear to ear. And the, the, it just went dead. There was no response. She says, I don't, I don't even know how to respond to that. Nobody's ever said that before. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we only hired back. We only had four of us after that. And we were way more efficient. So getting a consultant in to help you use the CRM better ultimately got you to the point where you lost five, but you only, I guess, you only had to replace two of the five right, to get back right. to where you we were. We just replaced two of the five. That's how inefficient. I remember I would say, you know, I need to know the return on this particular account for the last year. It would take me 24 hours to get that. And after the, the consultant was in, it took me five minutes. <laughs> to learn to run db cams myself right wait so when was this when did all this go down for this you? was i'm just gonna say it was around 10 years ago who was the consultant that you hired that got you back on track do you remember oh she's from minnesota and i think she just became a planner herself and shannon clark 
seems to be the name that comes to mind. We'll look it up and add, a, add something in the show notes if we can uh, track Shannon down if she's still consulting. <laughs> in fact, I use that with clients today. I tell them that story and I say, so my goal for you is I'd like you to be smiling when you write us our retainer check. And I had one client say, well, Rick, is it okay if I'm just not frowning? <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, we'll take that. What you just described is literally the reason they don't hire. The business risk, the fear, the the concern that what happens if I build this business to the point where I'm relying on all these employees and then and then people end up quitting and leaving and my and my yeah. business blows up. So did you ever have the thought of not rehiring them and say like, well, you know what, this is a good time to just keep like my 15 awesomest clients that actually pay me well enough that I can probably make almost as much money with just my my small top subset of top clients because I've been doing this for a while and just forget the rest. I'm letting it go. Yes, I, I did think about that. And I, I want to say that managing for me never gets easier. That was Darla's resistance to growing. She's like, every time you add a new person here, it's not just adding one person. You're, if you have four people, you are now adding f five new relationships uh, because that person's going to have a relationship with everybody else. And it starts getting really right. complex. Uh, I'm kind of even in a transition today. I recently had a staff meeting and five out of at that time there were seven five out of seven had to think about whether they were going to continue to be with the firm and that was 45 days ago for me it doesn't get easier do you try to hire around that does that get you to a point where you know you're making some good money you've got a good base of clients I mean, is there a point where you just say i'm just not going to grow anymore because I'm satisfied with what I've got and any more growth requires more staff that I, I just don't want to manage or I'm not comfortable managing or I don't want to hire. I'm just expecting at some point they're going to leave and my business is going to get harder. Yeah. It, for me, it was a thought of maybe I should sell. And I actually went out and got, uh, I do an appraisal every year of my business, but explored what was it, what's the market like out there for selling. Because for me, it's like today, if I had five out of seven people leave, I just don't think I'm interested in working that hard to keep it. Is that just a age stage of life where you are just you're not you're not up for doing that battle? Yeah, again? Yeah, I, I think so. And my thought was, well, heck, if I'm going to have if, uh, rather than that, I think maybe I should be the one that leaves and uh, just sell it. You can't quit me. I'm selling you first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like the, the, the ultimate uh, girlfriend, boyfriend rejection, but in the business context. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's very much something that uh, I have looked at very seriously with the thought that, well, I'll retain the value that I have here and I don't need to sell my practice to retire. I'm very fortunate in that way. I could close the doors tomorrow and I'm, I'm okay. But it still, you know, has a significant value, twice of what I yeah. report on my, my income, on my uh, balance sheet. How do you decide a transition like that when you're thinking about it? Like, is this a, a self-reflection thing? Is this a sit down with your personal balance sheet and contemplate your, the kind of retirement you could support for yourself? No, it's not about the money. Uh, really for me. I mean, it would be about the money if I'm going to say, hey, uh, if most of the people here aren't on with the vision I have. Sure. You may as well maximize the value if you're going to make yeah, a transition. Yeah, let's monetize sure. the value and let's uh, go out and uh, have my encore career. And this is all around trying to create a DDO, Deliberately Developmental Organization, which is kind of my passion right now of of how do we create organizations that can help facilitate our core purpose, which is to transform the emotional and financial well-being of people. And that's probably not your normal core purpose of a financial planning firm. But that's, that's part of my vision is we're in the well-being business, the wellness business. And it's really hard to separate emotional well-being from financial well-being. At least I've I found that difficult. And so it's uh, how do we how do we attract a group of people that are passionate 
about uh, personal growth and passionate about helping people do that because it's the numbers are pretty important, but it's more than the numbers. So we're not talking about a traditional office here. And guess what? Not everybody out in the workplace is interested in personal growth or or the commitment to be part of that type of a uh, of an organization. So I haven't right. figured this one out at all. When you look back over your career at this point, what do you kind of view as highs and lows of the career? I think the lows definitely were losing the five out of six people. And I'm in a low today. You know, ironically, as we speak, um, I'm in probably the last 60 days have been the roughest time of, um, of my entire financial planning career. Because of slower growth, staff challenges? Staff challenges. Uh, staff really challenging the values that I hold pretty close, uh, a non-alignment, okay. uh, which has been kind of shocking and surprising to me, but a real non-alignment of values. When I, le- I look at um, overall, you know, I have faced bankruptcy six times. Let's just say I have gone to near nothing, nothing or insolvent six times in my career, which had, had nothing to do with financial planning. I was going to say, were any of those tied to the planning? Yeah, uh, that, that's planning like I, I got a college education in futures because that's what it cost me. Uh, we had the B-52s leave town, and, and uh, if all of my rentals were full, I was still 1500 a month short. Ouch. I was in the mortgage business when um, the, the Iowa farmland imploded, uh, dropped by two-thirds, and I had all sorts of farm oh, mortgages. Yes. Uh, I factored paper in uh, Silver Springs, Maryland, close to you. And the yes. company that we factored for uh, went out of business and left us holding hundreds of thousands of dollars of worthless paper. Oh. I've had real estate that uh, tanked. And then I went into the hardwood floor business. Uh, I saw that business go depreciate by 80% and got out in six months. So the irony, I guess, is like... As much as we talk about the risks and the challenges of the advisory business and the AUM model and all that, this is the stable one for you? <laughs> this is where I made my money. <laughs> well, I, and I told my brother to close our real estate firm in 2009. Or I said, well, you want to buy me out? He wouldn't buy me out. Today, it's by and large the number one firm in, in the area. And it's, by the way, I should fully disclose it's not mine anymore. <laughs> I gave it away to my wife. After all that, I transitioned to your wife and sep- just to further separate from your advisory That's firm. That's correct. So, I mean, yeah, I have had a ton, ton of lows. When I've looked over this list, you know, I lost my first two CFPs when they got their designations. They left me. I lost my first actual CFP due to a personality clash uh, at the office. I mean, I look over this this list and I'm like, how have I possibly, <laughs> how have I possibly had any success? <laughs> when you look back, like, you know, for that, for that many highs and lows and the stress of it, I mean, I guess I got two questions. Like how, how do you cope? I mean, what are your coping mechanisms just for that kind of stress and up and down? And then the, you know, my second question, like, what do you think is it that's have driven the success despite some of these challenges and ups and downs? I'm a, a great consumer of therapy, so... Um, <laughs> You're an advocate, right? So nothing wrong with coaching therapy outside input? And in fact, it, it, it was my divorce that is the only reason I ever got into um, uh, financial therapy, life planning, all came from a divorce, so uh, that that was life changing. So with the coping, I guess I have I've always been into personal development for myself. So I've I have spent a reasonable amount of time reflecting on um, how did I get here? You know, as uh, Tracy Beckus used to ask. So Rick, how did you create this? A uh, question I do not even appreciate until this day. Um, And so I think my success, my success has not been because of my ability to manage people. I think that's my Achilles heel. 
And I know that that okay. may be a surprising to a lot of people who perceive me to be like the therapist CFP. And when I've told uh, audiences, when I've spoken that I am a left brain number crunching type of a planner. I had to spend $80,000 in 12 years to learn I had a right brain. It's not something cute. It is the truth. Uh, I am just not uh, instinctually a social person. Uh, that's really my blind spot. So I think it's my the high level of responsibility I have. Uh, I, I've always had an owner's attitude, but you could argue I've always been an owner. I have a huge amount of technical expertise and integrity and competency, and I've been able to get that across to my clients. I think that's largely why they've hired me and stuck with me. Uh, and I guess a lot of tenacity, you know? I mean, the average person, according to stats I've seen, the average millionaire uh, has um, faced bankruptcy 3.1 times. I have faced it six times, and I think I ought to be a billionaire by now. So you are you are averaging out some miraculous millionaire entrepreneur who's had no bankruptcies. You, you and that <laughs> guy or gal are how we get to the average of three. Yeah, so that's right. fantastic. Yeah, the average non-millionaire has made 1.6. Uh, real serious yeah. mistakes. Was there ever a particular decision or, or like crossroads you hit looking back where you feel like this is what made it work out going forward? Like, was there like, was there a positive inflection point, transition point somewhere where you, you made the decision you look back and say like, this is what got me on the right trajectory or, hmm. or to the right level of success for myself? I can't, I just really can't come up with one big, turning point. I mean, every time I've hit pain, it's been a growth opportunity. In fact, I remember when my wife called me and said, you know, I want to divorce. The very first thought I had was I'm going to grow from this. And uh, last night I was talking to my... It's a very positive way to well, take Well, it's kind of weird. <laughs> and I was talking to my wife last night about all the challenges I'm facing now and her the words out of her mouth was well another growing opportunity and we refer to it in terms that has a vulgarity in it called an afgo another freaking growth opportunity afgo i like that afgo another freaking yeah and i have had a lot of those and i guess in some of them i have learned some things and i've also uh had the opportunity to relearn things so it's just been a series, a series of steps. But I, I think I never did give up when, I mean, obviously, when, when you have the financial blowups I have, yeah. I think my integrity that I'm not going bankrupt, that's an, another money script that I borrowed from these people and I am going to pay it back. If it's the last thing I ever do, I'm not going to renege on my word. I think that is one huge reason why I uh, stayed the course and found creative ways to work out of all of that. And it made me a better planner. There's no question about that. I've told my, my clients, I say, well, I've made all the mistakes so I can help you not make the same ones. So is there anything looking back that you wish you'd done substantially different? One of those things I hear a lot for people that have been successful is like, you, we hit those challenge points. We hit those failure points. It's it's an AFCO. It's another freaking growth opportunity. But but we do learn from it, and often we end up doing some better things in the future because of what we learn. So there's mistakes we make where we say, all right, that probably wasn't ideal, but I did learn from it. It it helped shape me in the future. I didn't like it at the time, but it was probably a positive looking back. And then every now and then you get a few things where you just look back and say, no, I, I just really wish I'd done that differently. Yeah. There, that wasn't, that wasn't an AFCO. That, that was, that was just a bad decision. Like, are, are there, are there any things like that where you look back and say, no, I, I think I just did this wrong. Like just, Hey, anyone listening, don't, don't do what I did at this particular juncture or decision. Gee, I've just had to have a lot of those. Uh, the one that's on my mind is the one of a couple of years ago when I told our our best star upcoming financial planner to go take another job. I, I didn't like the way that she asked me for a raise. And I've had feedback from four people I trust that, Rick, 
uh, you really got in your way of yourself here. That was really an overreaction. So, you know, that stings uh, when I, I see myself being my own worst enemy. And I've kind of been taught, I mean, I could just list off the things that I'd like to do better. And I got this little voice in my ear saying, you know, all those were necessary to bring you to where you are today. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I, I think uh, my son was just elated. He was telling me this morning that they finally got their robot to throw a ball into a net. <clears throat> They're in a robotics competition and how elated they were. And they took a victory lap around the school. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of failures that went into figuring out that one success. And I think that is so true of success in business. Um there are a ton of failures that go into the tip of the iceberg of the <clears throat> diagram that, that you have. There's a huge amount of sweat and blood and tears and perseverance that goes into being on that stage and being perceived as somebody who has it all together and who is successful. How do you define success then? And I find it an interesting juxtaposition. $200 million practice, 100 clients, $1.2 million of revenue, taking home $250,000, $300,000, which is a pretty great number by most people's standards. A lot of advisors I know are struggling at different points, would love to be where you are. And your feeling is this is a low point for the practice. And I don't even know how many more years I want to be doing this. So <laughs> this is kind of the point where like everybody has some very different definitions of of success. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you define success? And what is it about this, at least outwardly financially successful practice that is still not inspiring to move forward from here? Yeah, it's obviously success. There's a money component to success. So I, I can look at myself and I can look at my net worth. And I, I have to conclude that I've been successful. And I look at some of the trappings of uh, my career and I say, yes, I've had some successes. And I remember the first time somebody said, Rick, tell me about your success. And I literally looked over my shoulder to see who he was talking to. <laughs> because I just, I'm like, how can you look at me and think that I am successful? And, and so part of that's that, uh, that inner uh, critic that I carry around with me that has some definition of success that is something I will never reach, some uh, standard of perfection that is, is set so high. But I do think in success is an internal job. Uh, I really do. It's somewhere having enough, reaching a place that this is enough of having uh, a peace and serenity and I do remember the time I can go right to where I was standing at the uh, uh, security pad out here in the hall of the office and I had this realization that I was happy and this was such an odd realization how when did this happen I thought to myself when when did I become happy <laughs> it just kind of snuck up on me <laughs> and uh, and so today, I'm not in that happy place, you know, and I can should and ought myself that I should look at, look at everything. I ought to be happy today. And, you know, and I think it's a continuum, too. I think we hit certain times in our life where we, we really do, we can have serenity and joy. And, and there's, a, there's a new challenge, something new that uh, just the human experience is going to give us. And I think it's just rising up, you know. To, to meet that challenge and to, to, to for me, just to be a, uh, uh, one of our core values here is always improving. Uh, ascribing to that and yet understanding for myself, which is my big challenge, is that I will never, I will never improve to be good enough. You know, there's just a standard that I won't hit, which is my perfectionism, which is one of my um, challenges to let go of. I suppose on the flip side, I mean, so many businesses grow and are successful because they, they maintain that element of always trying to be improving. I mean, not necessarily, right? There, there's sort of an, an implication to me even around a label like improving. Like we're not trying to reach an, an end point goal of improved to 
accomplish blank. It's more of just an improving, continuous yeah, journey. Yeah, it's, like it's the water I swim in. I mean, even now I'm interested in how do we add groups to a financial planning firm? How do we have a group of retired folks? How do we have a group of succession uh, uh, business owners looking at succession? How do we have a group of, of clients who are enablers to their kids and hurting themselves financially? I've never really been satisfied with the status quo. The good news is that drives the business forward. The bad news is that makes it hard to ever decide when you've gotten there. Yeah, you know, I will never get there, I don't think. That's part of my entrepreneurial pioneering spirit is, okay, how can how can we make this a richer experience? Uh, how can we add value and, and keeping an eye on the bottom line? Uh, something that that is wanted and I've just I I look at my practice here as kind of being a laboratory well I think that's a a fantastic note to wrap up on that that recognizing that balance of I guess always improving the the entrepreneurial benefits of that and and maybe reflecting that that becomes a little bit of the entrepreneurs or business owners curse that 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 continual drive for self-improvement does a lot to move a business forward and sometimes makes it hard for us to be satisfied with where we get to, even even when we get to a point that kind of outwardly the math would say this is very financially successful, uh, yet it doesn't feel like the itch has been scratched yet and, and the end. Yeah, when I there. used to come back from the ICFB retreat, my staff, I learned, was, was, would just... Uh, uh, tremble because I would come back with 80 things that I wanted to do. You come back, you'd come home with ideas. Oh yeah. And I remember that list went to 20 and then I remember that list went to five. And then I remember I'm going, you know, this retreat isn't what it used to be. I am just not getting yeah. anything out of it. And then I, I had this idea that, well, Rick, maybe you have actually learned. <laughs> maybe. Maybe you're actually doing a lot of the stuff you you uh, ascribed to in that? the past. Uh, so it, it's it's a uh, never-ending uh, cycle for me. And you're right. A part of it, my cautiousness keeps me from being so entrepreneurial that I do what most entrepreneurs do, which is four out of five startups fail. But yeah, it can be the bane where my staff, I remember one of my associates once said, Rick. Can we just do one thing the same way for an entire year? <laughs> That's a familiar refrain I know from a lot of people <laughs> who are entrepreneurs. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you for, for joining us, for sharing what I, I think is a really interesting story around the, I like to think of the some of the real world dynamics of what we go through as advisors and business owners and, and finding some of that journey of, what's successful as a business, what's rewarding for clients, what's rewarding for us, and the you know, the challenges and the setbacks that, that come from it. Although I, I have to admit, I really don't know very many people who lost eighty percent of their staff in in, in sixty days. That's that's uh, a a painful transition, I think, by anybody's standards. But thank you for joining us and sharing yeah, the story. Thanks for having me. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.